Hello, and welcome to the 48th annual AAKP National Patient Meeting, Transforming American Kidney Health, Patients Take the Lead. My name is Richard Stacewitz, and I'm a proud AAKP ambassador for the state of Illinois and a home hemodialysis patient. I had the great honor of introducing this next session titled The Decade of the Kidney, Innovations in Transplantation, Artificial Kidneys and Xenotransplantation. During the recently held AAKP Global Summit on Kidney Disease Innovations. This was such an exciting and timely session, giving a glimpse of what the future holds for kidney care from industry and research experts that we are sharing it again for the benefit of this audience and my friends at AAKP asked that I help tee it off. So sit back, relax, and be inspired by the great work being done to advance the world of transplantation. My name is Richard Stasewitz, and I am an AAKP ambassador and a home dialysis patient. I'm a retired history professor uh, whose kidneys failed when I was 22 years old. Uh, and as most people, I crashed into kidney failure. I had no idea that I had any health issues. Uh, between then and now, I've been on in-center dialysis twice for a total of two years. And I was fortunate to have two kidney transplants, which lasted 37 years combined. I lost the last transplant, which had lasted 27 years, four years ago after it, they found a cancerous tumor in that kidney. So it had to be removed. So I'm back, I'm currently on home hemodialysis and doing well. Uh, the transplants, however, uh, allowed me and my wife to live a very vigorous life. We traveled around the world. We've had two children who are now ages 30 and 26. And so I've been fortunate uh, to have had those two transplants. Uh, and so I'm looking forward to the new innovations that we're talking about at this conference for future transplant recipients. Being part of AAKP allows me the access to the education and resources I need to not only uh, improve my quality of life as a kidney patient, but also the platform to use my voice and my experiences in a meaningful way to demand more innovation and more choices for myself and others diagnosed with chronic kidney disease. In 2019, AAKP announced two major initiatives, AAKP Global and the Decade of the Kidney. AAKP is engaged internationally because we are committed to educating patients and leaders across the globe on the importance of kidney disease prevention new innovations in treatment, and the necessity to save, the, to save more lives. We believe that an un, united patient voice can drive more intelligent alignment of the policy, regulatory, and payment decisions necessary to bring new, safe innovations to patients without undue waiting and needless interference. Across the globe, AAKP is with patients, medical professionals, researchers, and medical industry allies to address the many unmet needs of the global kidney community. AAKP believes this international collaboration can help close the gaps in US and in countries where healthcare systems and or infrastructure do not fully support patient consumer choice or immediate access to new treatments. I'm pleased to introduce our session titled Pathways to Artificial Implantable Organs, Industry Commitment to Innovation. This is a pretty incredible session you are about to listen to as you will hear from some amazing individuals who are working tirelessly to make advancement in transplantation, including artificial kidneys and xenotransplantation a reality. And we are honored to have two panelists who have, who have been recent recipients of the 2023 Kidney X Artificial Kidney Prize winners. This competition recognized participants' innovative approaches to developing a bio-artificial kidney. Our first presenter is a longtime friend and ally to AAKP 
and a back-to-back -back Kidney X Prize winner. Dr. Shuval Roy is a professor at the University of California, San Francisco, Department of Bioengineering and Therapeutic Sciences. He is also a founding member of the UCSF Pediatric Device Consortium, whose mission is to accelerate the development of innovative devices for children's health. Likely, <coughs> likely you have heard of Dr. Roy throughout this conference as the technical director of the Kidney Project, a nationwide effort focused on creating a small, surgically implantable bioartificial kidney to treat kidney failure. He, along with Dr. William Fazell, medical director out of Vanderbilt University, lead, leads a team that is dedicated to making this technology a reality for kidney patients. AAKP announced, sorry, our formal partnership and support of the Kidney Project in 2018 because we are impressed by Dr. Roy and Dr. Fazell and their commitment to the inclusion of patient insight data and patient lived experiences in their work. Our former board member and, and valiant advocate, Brian Hess, spent hours on capital advocating for the Kidney Project and a promise of art, artificial organs. I also have to admit that I am a, on the patient advisory council for the Kidney Project, so I've been intimately involved myself. Without further ado, please welcome to the podium, Dr. Roy. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, and I must thank AAKP for this honor, and I was here years ago, and I feel it's homecoming again. So my thanks for hosting this one-of-a-kind event, and my team and I from the Kidney Project are honored to join you and be a partner as we all work towards the building of an implantable artificial kidney. So I dedicate this presentation to the memory of Brian Hess, AAKP ambassador and board member who's seen here with Suzanne Ruff, a picture we took outside at the first summit. Brian passed away since that last meeting, but what I remember him saying to me outside was, Dr. Roy, keep going. And that's precisely what we've been doing. My journey in artificial kidneys started over 20 years ago. I had just begun my career as a biomedical engineer when I met Dr. William Fizel, who was then contemplating a career in nephrology. He opened my eyes to the challenges of patients facing kidney failure, including the tremendous shortage of transplant organs available and the dire and significant limitations of dialysis. Through our discussions, we quickly realized that while we could improve dialysis machines, patients needed and deserved something way better, a treatment that improves their health while also allowing them to keep their job, travel without burdens of carrying machines, and consume food and drink without restrictions. Our vision is for an, is for an universal donor kidney. This device, the implantable bioartificial kidney, or IBAC as we call it, is powered by blood pressure alone, no batteries or external connections needed. This device is a two-stage system that replicates the main functions of a healthy kidney. The first stage, the hemofilter, is built from highly efficient semiconductor silicon membranes, which filter toxins from blood using the patient's blood pressure alone to drive the filtration and without the need for blood thinners. The other main functions of the kidney is replicated by a second stage, the bioreactor, that also uses silicon membranes to encapsulate growing kidney cells that provide some of the key functions of a kidney while protecting the cells from the patient's immune system. The IBAC is a compact device intended to be surgically implanted into the abdominal region you know, with a procedure very much similar to a kidney transplant. The development of the IBAC is grounded in proven science and demonstrated technology pioneered at the University of Michigan by Dr. David Humes. He created the first bioartificial device for kidney failure 
and to date, still the only one that has made it into FDA-approved clinical trials. He took conventional dialysis technology at the time and combined it with renal tubule cells from cadaver kidneys to construct the renal assist device, or RAD as he called it, basically an artificial kidney that could connect to human externally. The results were incredibly encouraging. The RAD doubled the survival of ICU patients with kidney failure who otherwise died, and he did not use anti-rejection medicines in these patients. When Dr. Fizel and I learned of this work, we quickly connected with Dr. Humes, and they realized that the RAD was the perfect template for us to build on. The concept of the RAD is brilliant. Instead of trying to recreate a full kidney biologically, it took a hybrid approach to provide those essential kidney functions, basically a minimum viable product to keep patients off dialysis. To provide the filtration functions of a healthy kidney, the RAD used conventional dialyzer membranes as the hemofilter. The other key functions of the kidney were accomplished using renal tubule cells that lined the other dialyzer to serve as the bioreactor. Moreover, by housing the renal cells inside the dialyzers, they are isolated from the patient's immune system, thereby avoiding the need for anti-rejection drugs. We recognize that the RAD's biohybrid architecture of combining artificial components that were built with biological elements that were grown could also provide the fastest route to get our implantable bioartificial kidney, the IBAC, to patients. To miniaturize the RAD, we use semiconductor silicon technology. We chose silicon as it is the most perfected human-made material ever. As we can see from the development of cell phones and electronics, silicon technology allows for extreme miniaturization of sophisticated systems while leveraging almost 60 to 70 years of reliable and cost-effective manufacturing. This is a prototype of the IBAC that we've built. It consists of a hemofilter and the bioreactor which houses the renal tubule cells. The features of the engineered silicon membranes allows the bioreactor to provide immunoprotection, meaning no anti-rejection medicines, prevents the passage of viruses between the cells and the patient. The bioreactor does not require the growth of new blood vessels since it's connected directly to the blood vessels similar to kidney transplant. And by using human kidney cells, we can avoid some of the controversies that are associated with use of animals. And by growing them as a single layer of cells in our device, we avoid the need for complex construction. Today, we've arrived at the point where the IBAC is no longer a theoretical concept. The fundamental proof of principle that you can combine a filter with cells has been established. We've shown working prototypes in pigs fully implanted with no external connections and do not require immunosuppression. The device runs off blood pressure, and as you can see at the very tip of that catheter going, that is going to the bladder, you're creating urine. Today, Medicare spends almost $50 billion annually on treating end-stage kidney disease. In a cost-benefit analysis, we conservatively, conservatively determined that if only 20% of patients were implanted with an IBAC, Medicare could save over $6 billion annually. We're now ready to move to the first clinical trials. We have been within this striking distance for some time, but we need to be able to bring the right groups and the right resources together. We envision we can complete the preclinical work and get to the FDA for the first clinical studies within as few as three years. Achieving this milestone will then allow us to bring in private investors and industry who can then work with us to take this to the largest clinical studies as well as help with scaling up in manufacturing and distribution. Let me end by thanking those who have contributed financially to advance our work. My team at the Kidney Project and I are exceedingly grateful for their support and welcome others, including you online and people in this room, to join us. Finally, we also appreciate our partnership with AAKP and its support for an international consortium that will bring expertise together and raise funds dedicated to creating implantable artificial kidneys within the decade of the kidney. So, in Brian's words, let's 
keep going and finish the job. Thank you. Dr. Roy, we appreciate your sharing with us the latest on news on the kidney project and what is needed to remake this to make this treatment uh, happen for patients. Thank you for your presentation. We are also joined today by Dr. David Cooper, uh, another Kidney X Prize winner in 2021 and 2023. Dr. Cooper is also a world-renowned Zeno transplantation researcher and heart surgeon, currently serving as a faculty member in the Center for Transplantation Sciences at Harvard Medical School. Uh, since 1996, Dr. Cooper has been a full-time Zeno transplantation researcher and has published more than 1,000 medical and scientific papers. AAKP was very pleased that in the midst of the COVID-19, he con consistently made time for this organization by providing presentations and great support to our efforts to educate patients and policymakers in Washington on where the future of xenotransplantation was headed. And we are honored to have him here today with us. Dr. Cooper, I welcome you up to provide your presentation. Uh, <clears throat> well, thank you very much indeed. And I'm, I'm, it's a great pleasure to be invited here. I'm, I'm most grateful. Um, I, wonder, I didn't put in my slides that I'm actually a consultant to eGenesis, one of the companies that is making pigs for this purpose. Uh, but the, the, what I'm going to say is my own personal opinion. And eGenesis will be uh, represented by a later speaker. So um, I'm, you heard that I... Uh, uh, um, is, am I pressing the right button here? Yes. Uh, you, I'm sure you saw this news uh, uh, over a year ago now uh, of the pig heart transplant carried out by colleagues at the University of uh, Maryland in Baltimore. Uh, the patient lived for two months. For much of that time, the heart beat very, very well, but then it probably got some rejection, and we're not quite sure why, but there were co complicated reasons. But it was very encouraging that the heart did so well for such a long time. Unfortunately, the patient was so debilitated before the transplant that he really didn't recover as, as one would have expected a patient to. Um, I used to be a heart transplant surgeon, and, and I had patients who went out of hospital after four or five days. Um, but he, in two months, didn't recover because he was so debilitated at the beginning, which is often the case with patients who undergo these very experimental procedures. Now, you, you heard that I was a heart surgeon, and I, I like this riddle. I'm sometimes reminded of the differences between a rhinoceros and a cardiac surgeon. One is a thick skin, a small brain, and charges a lot. The other is a large animal that lives in Africa. Now, you're only allowed to make this joke if you are a cardiac surgeon yourself, because it's, uh, otherwise you get uh, criticized. Um, but today, I am actually a medical expert here, because the definition of a medical expert is a guy from out of town with slides, which I fulfill that criteria. So what I'm going to say is very important, as I'm a medical expert today. Now, this is a slide recently drawn up, um, which shows that the, the, that, uh, the number of, pay of donors is increasing human deceased donors, the number of transplants is increasing in red, uh, but the number of patients being added to the waiting list is increasing actually further um, and more, more rapidly than, that, uh, than the, the, uh, the number of transplants that are performed. And this is our, our problem, and that's why we're all here today, and we're looking at this, tr res resolving this problem one way or the other. The advantage that we have in the, in the xenotransplant world is that we do have a whole organ that we could transplant. Our problem is different from Dr. Roy's. He's creating a new organ. We have a new organ, but we have to prevent the rejection of that organ, and that's, that's a completely different problem. So the problem is an inadequate number of organs for transplantation, and the solution is, we think, uh, Joe Tecto will be speaking next, and I, and, and uh, Mike Curtis from, Zena, from uh, eGenesis. We believe that the transplantation organs from gene-edited pigs, or what we call xenotransplantation, is, is the answer. And fortunately, we've hit upon the pig, and, and the pig has a lot going for it in this respect. It breeds in large numbers, 
Um, it grows quickly to adults human size. Uh, there are a number of logistic reasons why the pig would be an ideal source of organs for humans. We've used pig heart valves for many, many years, 50 years or more. Uh, we've used pig insulin as treatment for diabetes and so on in the past. And so we're quite used to using pigs for our own purposes. And so from an ethical perspective, I don't think it's too, too big a problem. Now, this is a pig organ put in by colleagues years ago, uh, in Canada, in fact, um, pig organ into a baboon. You can see immediately after it's revascularized, the clamps are taken off after the surgery, the, the, the kidney looks very nice. It's pink, well perfused, and it's going to do well. But this is an ordinary pig organ. It's a wild, what we call a wild-type pig organ from an ordinary domestic pig. But within minutes, it can look like this, literally within five minutes. Um, it can be black, all the blood vessels in it are thrombosed or they burst and there's been bleeding into the tissues. There's edema and cellular infiltration and so on. It's a very vigorous immune response rejection. And this literally can take place within a few minutes and certainly within the, within the few hours. Uh, quite different from if you put a human organ into a human or a, or a monkey organ into a monkey, uh, which will probably take about a week to be rejected, five to seven days or so. This, this occurs when, when you cross the species barrier, you get rejection very, very rapidly. And so this was a problem that we faced uh, many years ago now uh, when we didn't have genetic engineering. And Klaus Hammer, the late Klaus Hammer, who was both a surgeon and a veterinary surgeon, he said the evolutionary distance between humans and pigs comprises 80 million years. That's how long it's been since we've been diverging the pig from the human. And so he said, what we're trying to do is to outwit evolution. So no wonder it's taken us 30 or 40 years to get to where we've got to now, because we are trying to overcome a biological process that has been de devolving from each other for, for, for uh, 80 million years. So that's why it's been a, a bigger problem than we all hoped it would be. And this is how we felt for the last 30, 40 years. I'm the person on the right, the little, little guy on the right. We're holding back this vigorous immune response, um, which is overwhelming the, the pig kidney. Um, and it's been tough, uh, 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 as Joe will know as well, it's been very tough uh, trying to overcome these problems one after the other um, uh, over, the, over these years. And I like this quote, it's a, light, a little like wrestling a gorilla but you don't quit when you're tired, you quit when the gorilla is tired. And I think the gorilla, the vigorous immune response, is beginning to get tired now. It's beginning to get exhausted because we overcome bits of it bit by bit. And so now we're really beginning to be on top of it. Now, Randall Morris, a friend of mine who uh, was, used to be a cardiac surgeon, was also very interested in, in, in xenotransplantation research. Some years ago, he was quoted as saying, there are three golden rules for achieving successful xenotransplantation. But then he added, unfortunately, we don't know any of them. And at the time he said that, it was quite true. But now we do know most of them, I think, or many of them. And we are, at last, uh, after all these years of work, making some significant progress. Now, this is probably the most important slide I will show you today. This is the first time in transplantation, which has been going on now for over 70 years, uh, in the clinic. This is the first time that we were able to modify the donor as opposed to just treating the recipient. All we've done up to now basically is to give immunosuppressive drugs, anti-inflammatory drugs and so on to the recipient, the human recipient. Now we can spend our time modifying the donor and over the years this has been very, very successful and we can deal most of the problems by by modifying the donor. We do still need immunosuppressive therapy to prevent the remaining rejection that goes on. But as you see at the bottom here, I say that eventually, I firmly believe that we may need no treatment of the recipient. We'll be able to do everything to the donor. The donor will be manipulated in such a way that kidney will no longer be rejected because we've put so much defense mechanisms into the, into the kidney. And that will be a huge step because as most of kidney patients know, their biggest problem is, is often the side effects of the drugs um, that they're receiving. So what are the solutions then? Well, the first thing we've mentioned is organs from the gene-edited pigs, and that has become quite sophisticated. Now we have pigs with 10 or more genetic manipulations, all geared to protect the organ 
from that immune response. Um, and there, have some, there are some novel immunosuppressive agents that have been introduced in recent years which seem to be much better at preventing rejection of a pig organ than the conventional immunosuppressive therapy that is used in patients today. And I think that's a, a, another significant factor in that we do have now better immunosuppression, particularly for xenotransplantation. Now, I'm not going to go into this. This is a schema of, of how uh, these pigs are genetically engineered, and, and Joe knows much more about this than I do. But you can take the, the nucleus out of a cell, a pig cell. You can manipulate it and put genes in, take genes out. Then you put the cell back into a, another pig cell, having removed that, that nucleus. And then you put that cell into a surrogate sow, and the, the, the pig offspring are uh, developed and, and bred uh, from that sow. So you then have a pig that, is, that has got the genetic manipulations that you put into the cell in the first place. And this has become very uh, much easier and cheaper uh, these days uh, with the CRISPR technology that's available now. And be, as a result of this, together with some immunosuppressive therapy, some pig kidneys are now functioning for well over a year. Um, and the results are improving all the time. But they're probably not yet consistent enough using the pigs that we have and the immunosuppression we have to warrant a clinical trial. The FDA would like to see more consistency in the results. We've got some extremely good results, but we also have some relatively early failures after a few weeks or months. So we, we're working towards how we can make this more consistent. And one way we can do it is to provide an improved immunosuppressive regimen to, to, the, to, the, to the monkey who's having the organ transplant. And what do we need in this immunosuppressive regime? It's very similar to what patients take today uh, with a human, uh, deceased human kidney transplant. We need to de de deplete the recipient uh, of the cells that cause rejection, mainly the lymphocytes. We need to inhibit recovery of those cells so they don't recover quickly and start to cause injury again. And we need to suppress the inflammatory response to the pig organ. There's a much greater inflammatory response uh, like you would see in rheumatoid arthritis, for example, uh, to a pig kidney than to a human kidney. So we need a combination of drugs that will, will, will prevent the cells returning, the, the cells that will make antibodies, they will be suppressed, and the inflammatory response will be suppressed. Um, and we are currently testing that, uh, as, as, as is Joe, it, with various uh, combinations of the drugs that are available to us. Now, if we can overcome that last remaining problem, uh, what patients would we might uh, offer uh, xenotransplantation to in the first place? Well, there are patients, unfortunately, on the waiting list, a large number of them, who will probably never be offered a deceased human donor organ. They may be, if you, if you, if you look at patients in the age range, say 55 to 65, if they have to wait five or 10 years for a human organ, they may be at a point then when they've either died because of other causes, perhaps other problems as well, or they've been taken off the waiting list because they've developed more comorbidities, other complications, which make them no longer a very suitable candidate for an organ transplant. If they're of blood group O or B, they have to wait longer on the waiting list than if they're of blood group, say, A or AB. And patients who have got a diabetic nephropathy, the, the kidney disease is a result of diabetes, they, on the waiting list, they tend to die earlier than patients who are not diabetic. And so I think you can predict these patients when you put them on the waiting list. And we obviously don't say to patients, you're probably never going to get an organ transplant because that would be very depressing for them and we don't know exactly which ones will and which ones won't. But we do know that they have a very high risk of not getting an organ transplant. And if we put, put that to them early on and said, but maybe we could give you a year or two or three or four or five years if we put a pig organ into you and you won't have to be on dialysis during that time, I think many of them would say, I'll take that risk. The risk, too, is if the, if the organ is rejected or they have some other major problem, we're going to take the pig organ out, they can go back onto dialysis. So it's not an all or nothing, it's just a, a matter of can we provide you with a period of time when you won't necessarily be on uh, dialysis, uh, and, and a lot of patients would like that, of course. 
And here you can see on this chart, if you look on the right-hand side in the red, they are patients who are on the waiting list. They were obviously good candidates when they were put on the waiting list. But within five years, 45% of them are either no longer with us or they've been taken off the waiting list because they have problems, other problems that have developed and they're no longer a suitable candidate. And if you go on beyond five years, obviously that, that uh, decline inc in include, increases. So we're talking of you know, probably 50% of the patients, even at five or six years, who would, would, ne would not get a transplant. Those patients, I think, should be offered a, 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 a pig organ transplant. I think many of them would, would want to take that opportunity. So I leave you with this thought. I believe quite strongly and firmly that one day organ transplantation from deceased human donors will be of historic interest only and that physicians and patients in the future, 20 or 30 years from now, will be saying, do you know once upon a time they used to put dead or organs from dead people into patients and now it's, it's unknown because we only use pig organs. And I think this is a, a major revolution that's going to take place in medicine over the next few years. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cooper, for giving us more insight into your work in the xenotransplantation space. Our next speaker is Dr. Joe Tector. Uh, he is the founder of Makana Therapeutics a company focused on developing clinical grade pigs with reduced geno, uh, XO antigen expression, making pig to human transplantation of these cells, tissues, and organs possible. Dr. Tector is also a professor of surgery and director of xenotransplant research at the Miami Transplant Institute in South Florida. He has also dedicated his career to solving organ shortages through xenotransplantation. Dr. Tector, Tector is a strong patient advocate who understands the unique needs of kidney patients and the need for greater choices in care treatments. Please welcome Dr. Tector. Thank you. It's nice to be here. So the disclosure is, I think, pretty self-evident after we talked about this. Um, and, and actually, David and I are old friends, so I think uh, our talks are going to complement each other well. And so I'm going to kind of start where David took, where uh, David left off. And so it, it, what the work he talked about, it's incredible, and a lot of it is his. Um, but now we're talking about what do you need to do to actually try this in patients. And so we've kind of broken it down into six elements. You need to be, have a suitable donor pig. You have to have preclinical data in a model that, that would support uh, moving toward a clinical trial. You have to have suitable immunosuppressive protocol that is not too toxic. And then you have to be able to test the pigs to make sure that they will not transmit any diseases. Once you have all of those things, then you're going to need barrier housing to, to house the pigs in kind of a medical grade facility. And then once you have all of those things, you need to be able to pick which patients are going to do well with the kidney, because you don't want to do this and find out the hard way that, that you aren't a candidate for this, this kind of therapy. And so let's start with a suitable donor pig. Um, the, the, what this field has been suffering from for the last 50 years is you and I have antibodies against the donor pig, and quite frankly, antibody media rejection has brought down virtually every graft that's ever been put in any kind of a preclinical model, and for that matter, any of the clinical attempts. The blood groups, pigs have blood group O and A, so you want a pig that has blood type O because that's uh, less antigenic. We've tested that. And then there was a concern that pigs have uh, porcine endogenous retrovirus. There was some concern that the, that could be transmitted. That concern has been largely mitigated in the last 25 years, but you do need to have a strategy for how you want to minimize uh, any transmission of the porcine endogenous retrovirus. There's two that people are uh, looking at. Dr. Curtis will probably talk about the PERV knockout pig. Uh, there's also about 10% of pigs are uh, born PERV C negative. And to get a, uh, the porcine endogenous retrovirus to even get into a transformed cell, which is the only kind of cell they've been able to get it into, you have to uh, have an AC re uh, recombination event. So PERV A and PERV C have to recombine. And so if you don't have PERV C, then you don't have that opportunity, and so that, that eliminates that problem. 
the other thing that's very important is that each pig and each transplanted organ has to be the same so that if you get a transplant and I get a transplant and then Dr. Cooper gets a transplant, we all get the same uh, therapy. So that's very important. So our team at McConaughey Therapeutics and out of my lab at, uh, started at Indiana University, but now at the University of Miami, we deleted three glycan, uh, three enzymes that produce key xenoantigen, gly glycan xenoantigens. And what's interesting about that is when you get rid of those, we've tested over 3,000 waitlisted patients. The graph in the middle is just uh, showing that the, uh, there's this, the red box, um, that's the people that are, have no detectable antibodies, and that turns out to be 30% of the people on the wait list, so it's not everybody, but that's what we want to start with, is people that have no detectable antibodies to the pig organ. They would be unlikely to experience early antibody-mediated attack of the, of the graft and should be able to receive chemical immunosuppression to prevent rejection. So now we've got the pig that we want to talk about, so now you need a preclinical model. And really there are two that people are talking about. Uh, there's the non-human primate model, which uh, is, involves rhesus monkeys or baboons, uh, or cinemologous monkeys, and you put the pig organs into them. Um, they're a little bit harder to work with. Um, it's, it's not easy to monitor them as, as much. They're not necessarily willing participants in, the, in getting a transplant. Um, they also have a positive cross-match, so they, we're making these pigs for humans, so they still have antibodies against uh, the, the pig organ, so you have to uh, provide a little bit different immunosuppression for that. People are also talking about the decedent model. Uh, we had, had uh, spent a lot of time when I was in Indiana in, in 2012 when he actually got approved to do this, but when our first primate went out 300 days, it became clear to us, how are you going to keep a decedent alive that length of time to extend what you're going to learn from that? And so the, the, the challenge in the decedent model is that you can't get out into the longer survival, which you know, nobody wants to get a transplant and only know what's going on for the first two or three days and then just sort of uh, feel your way through it. That's kind of how we did it in the very, very beginning, but I think you know, we're in a stage where we can do much better than that. So, and so as far as our um, preclinical model, we, we've got um, animals out now, and we'll show you that, that, that I think meet the requirement. But as far as immunosuppression goes, in an ideal world, you would use just drugs that have already been FDA approved. But so far in the preclinical models, we've been unable to do that. So there's a anti-CD40, anti-CD154 antibody family that Dr. Cooper referred to, uh, and they have an, about seven or eight of these. A number of them have good uh, toxicity profiles in human clinical trials for either allotransplantation, kidney transplants from human to human, or for, um, for some of the autoimmune diseases, and so they're available. You need acceptable survival in preclinical models, and you need an acceptable infectious profile in your preclinical model. And so using drugs that are either FDA approved or uh, have favorable toxicity profiles. So this is an anti-CD40 antibody. You can see we did a, a series of transplants and we have a median survival of 368 days. And so when the drug that, that we used, the, the experimental drug, was, was tested for humans to use in allotransplants, the survival required was 100 days. So that's actually quite effective. And we had minimum uh, infectious uh, issues. We did not treat animals for rejection. And if you look at the function of the kidney over the course of the time, you can see that they did well. We had two animals early that went out because they uh, had ureteral strictures, and that was probably a bad medical decision on our part. We saw that when we started. The problem is these are very expensive experiments, and once you are committed to it, uh, sometimes you make bad decisions. And that's been one of transplant's big problems. Electrolyte balance was great. The kidney, uh, the erythropoietin seemed to work because the hemoglobin stayed normal throughout. You didn't lose platelets, which is indicative of antibody rejection. They had a little bit of hyper, mild uh, hypercalcemia, and the phosphate was in normal range. So the kidney function is great until the end, so that's very, very encouraging. So now that you have that, you need to be able to have pathogen testing to say, okay, does this pig free from disease? And so we now have, it's fi I say 50, but it's 54 viruses that we've talked about with the FDA. We use digital droplet PCR, and what's great about it is each one of these dots is another test. So it's an incredible number of assays. So the accuracy is very, very high. So we can be very certain that we don't have um, uh, pathogens in our pigs. And also the uh, fungus and bacterial assays are all send outs. Those are not that complicated to do. 
So now that you have pathogen testing, you need a barrier facility. And it's kind of like, I don't know if you've heard about these organ recovery centers where they take donors and they take them to the recovery center rather than keep them at the hospital and then transplant teams come to the recovery center and it's a huge, huge benefit because you can schedule the cases, they're not get, the donors aren't getting bumped for trauma and you can do all kinds of testing. They, they aren't, uh, you're not competing for hospital beds so they can be a lot more patient about trying to uh, tune a donor up. So, it's, so we have a pig organ recovery center self-contained and the animals never leave the facility. And so it's, it's, it's exciting, but it's so you have sophisticated air handling. It's about 22,000 square feet. Um, you've got gene edited piglet production capability. So when the when babies are born, so clone pigs come out, they're a little bit weaker um, and they're smaller. So you have to uh, take a lot of care of them, uh, hands-on care. Um, then there's production housing. We've got a trained personnel. We have pigs behind the barrier. So uh, from that perspective, we're getting ready to go. So that takes us to patient selection, and, and there's two kinds. One is what are the medical conditions, like when you think about somebody's heart, when you think about uh, some of the you know, cancer considerations, you think about the lungs. But as far as immunologic, you wanna make sure that you pick a patient that has a minimum of antibodies. And so we've been screening uh, patients for the last 10 years to try and figure out and make the reagents to be able to evaluate uh, whether or not you, as a given person, have antibodies against this new pig. And so if we do poorly in this, and, and we did in the early 60s, okay, patients will not do well, the therapy won't move forward, and xenotransplantation could go through the same really prolonged dormant period that allotransplant was plagued with. And just to give you some kind of idea, there are some patients have antibodies to pigs, and when they do, they have antibodies to just about all of them. So this is 54 patients looking at class one MHC on a pig. So when you get your HLA typing, they have A, B, and C as your class one. So this is each one of these patients is being tested against 20 different um, pig uh, class one alleles. So you can see there's some people like this person here has a lot of antibody to just to, not to, to all of the alleles. And so that's going to be something that we're going to have to, one, to start with, be really, really smart and pay attention to and push that person toward allotransplantation, not xenotransplantation initially. But there are going to be ways to get around that without any question. So we have donor pigs that are available. We've got uh, definitive primate studies showing the mechanisms of action and immunosuppression that need to be uh, done or completed. Uh, the FDA, we've been in talks with the FDA to try and uh, move toward a trial. Um, they've asked us to do a GLP uh, study with, with um, acceptable um, exceptions. And so we are gearing up to start that in the next six weeks. Um, and so we have the, the piglets that are on the ground. They need to get a little bit bigger. Um, and we're waiting for the, some of the, the immunosuppressive drugs got to get shipped to us. But other than that, we, we're going to get started in late July, uh, first week of August. Uh, there's some question, and we don't have feedback yet on whether we are going to go have to wait a whole year of survival or if at six months if we have good biopsies or some intermediate period in between if we can go forward. Now, if you think about it, we've got more than 25 uh, animals have gone out more than a year. Uh, our longest survivor survived j barely short of five years. Um, we've got a, a, a number of animals out more than two years. So I think um, we're, we're hopeful that that the FDA will agree with us that between six to 12 months, if we have good uh, function, we've lost three out of over 105 transplants. It's an unusual time to lose the graft. And so we're hoping we could start a little bit earlier, but quite frankly, I got interested in this in 1984. Uh, Dr. Cooper's probably the only one who predates me, but uh, they say I'm not patient, but I think that that, that isn't really a fair assessment. Um, the detailed pathogen testing is, is critical, but it's developed, and the medical grade housing is available. And so uh, the next really big thing is going to be histocompatibility testing uh, to make to do really careful selection of the appropriate people that are going to benefit from this. And um, if we don't do this correctly or we compromise our decision making, I mean, everybody wants to get going, right? But we have to be smart now because every victory in this field has been hard fought and it's not going to change now. So if we don't, patients are going to suffer and, and xenotransplantation is going to languish. I want to just thank uh, my team um, and I want to particularly thank uh, Jose Estrada and, and Matt Tector, who's actually my brother. So he's uh, a beneficiary of two, the two Kidney X awards. 
uh, for Makata Therapeutics and Andrew Adams, our collaborator at Emory, has done all the primate transplants. And then we want to thank our, our sponsors. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Tector, for such an interesting presentation on Makana's approach to xenotransplantation and the company's commitment to helping save, pave the way for, the, for this advancement. The excitement continues with Dr. Mike Curtis, President and CEO of eGenesis. Dr. Curtis has more than 30 years of experience in scientific research and leadership in biopharmaceutical drug development across multiple therapeutic areas. At eGenesis, he is leading the company's commitment to ending the global transplant shortage and transforming the treatment of organ failure. Dr. Curtis is highly interested in lived experiences of patients around the world and has deep interest in re relieve, uh, relieving patient burdens for those who suffer from kidney disease and kidney failure. Please turn your attention to the monitor as we welcome Dr. Curtis, who is joining us remotely to the Global Summit. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks first for the invitation uh, by AKP to join. And it's a real privilege to share uh, this uh, presentation with, with Joe and, and David. Um, I think it's a very small world of the folks working in Xeno. And as both have outlined, the challenges are tremendous, but I think you know, at eGenesis, we're able to leverage the work that those two gentlemen and the field have really been pioneering over the past many decades. It's also a privilege really to represent the work of a large team at eGenesis. Um, we've been in this field now for about seven years. Um, and as David alluded to, applying some of the modern um, genome engineering technologies really to improve the compatibility between porcine donors and human recipients. Uh, so next slide, please. So, so broadly, you know, we envision, I think, as most of the folks that are here today and, and interested in transplantation is really envisioning a world where no one dies waiting for an organ. <clears throat> um, and I think, you know, as David showed in some of that data, some of the data, um, transplantation works incredibly well clinically, and it's just incredibly unfortunate that we don't have enough supply to go around. And we can help many, many more patients if we can solve that. So again, over the past, next slide, over the past several years, you know, eGenesis has, um, uh, yeah, next slide, please. Um, really created a diversified portfolio. So we'll talk about kidney, uh, our kidney program today, but we also have programs uh, for heart transplant, um, uh, liver perfusion to support patients in liver failure, as well as a pancreatic islet program. Um, we were founded on establishing really a core platform for genome engineering. It started out really as an engineering company uh, and now has really transformed into a transplant company. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how we, uh, to some of the points Joe made about creating pigs behind a barrier or, or how we refer to as clinical grade donors, GMP donors. Uh, we past 12 months have brought up our clean facility and expect to have our first clinical grade donors uh, born in the third quarter of this year. And we've had several interactions with the FDA over the past five years, uh, four to be uh, uh, complete. Um, and I think we have a very clear path, both for a, a first in human and kidney, and it, it is reflective of some of the things that that David and Joe had mentioned earlier, um, uh, as well as now a path to, to uh, study our organs in patients in liver failure, um, as well as uh, heart failure. Uh, next slide, please. So we, so not only do we envision a world where we can end weightless mortality, but if you think about the waitlist, you know, it's a contrived list, right? It's because we have to allocate, we need a wait list. But we know in kidney transplant, certainly, uh, transplant could benefit many more patients than get waitlisted because waitlist is an artificial you know, development. And so we think that when we solve this solid organ sh shortage problem, we can you know, bring this therapy to many more patients than we currently do. And then m even broadly, you know, beyond kidney, uh, we believe that the development of transgenic uh, donors, porcine donors, can really revolutionize the treatment of organ failure broadly across all organ types. Next slide. So over the past you know, five years, uh, I think we've um, really enabled the development of some of the most highly and most sophisticated uh, porcine edited donors uh, in the world. Um, as Joe alluded to, we take an approach to retroviral inactivation that uses CRISPR-Cas9, which we'll talk about. We also, again, leverage the work that's been done by Joe and others in the field about the identification of the triple knockout as a really important set of modifications. And then the other third sets of edits that we do are including uh, human regulatory transgenes into the porcine genome 
um, to regulate uh, mechanisms of rejection to improve and promote long-term graft survival. And as, as David alluded to, you know, the vision here is to be able to use porcine organs that don't require suppression. And we think the way to get there is one of the ways is to include uh, regulatory human trans genes to help promote long-term graft survival. Our first donor, which I'll talk about today, it took us about two years from concept to producing a donor that had all the edits and was expressing all the trans genes that we needed. Um, and more recently, we have a, a new technology that we, we refer to as single pass engineering, where we can go from a concept uh, to a fully edited donor in about seven months. So just to put it in perspective, um, we're um, editing these, uh, all of our donors carry anywhere between 55 and 65 edits. Um, which again, if you had said that five years ago, there was really no good way to do that. And most people are a little bit in disbelief that you could do it. Uh, I can tell you it wasn't trivial, <laughs> uh, but we're now doing it. Um, and up to this point, five years later, we have now four candidates that we've nominated into clinical development. And the first one should be entering the clinic later this year and early next year. And I'll talk about that. Uh, as Joe alluded to, the production facilities here are not trivial. Uh, you know, producing porcine donors that are clean and safe for humans is our priority. Uh, and this requires specialized facilities, which again, do not are, are not readily available and something they have to build. I'll, I'll share with you some of our preclinical data in the non-human primate kidney transplant model. Um, uh, and we've had, again, really good success uh, with over 750 days of post-transplant survival of a porcine kidney in a non-human primate recipient. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we've had many interactions with the FDA to get clarity on the nature of the donor, like how we're producing it, how it's controlled from an adventitious agent perspective, the duration and types of non-clinical studies we need to go to the clinic, and as David alluded to, the population. Um, and I think most of our feedback's been very consistent with what, what David and, and Joe had previously mentioned. So next slide. Um, so it, as I mentioned, we were started out in Cambridge here in Massachusetts, uh, really about genome engineering. And over the past two years, we've really expanded uh, our production facility. We have a large 200 acre production research farm in the Midwest, where we make somewhere between four to 500 uh, transgenic porcine donors a year. And then more recently, we've moved into a smaller facility because we don't need quite as many uh, clinical grade donors at this point. Um, and, and this facility in the in white to the right uh, is the facility mm -hmm. that we in, will be making donors for the clinic and for our GLP tox studies. Again, first piglets are scheduled to be born in the third quarter. Uh, we couldn't do any of this without really strong collaborations with our academic uh, partners. And as, as David mentioned, we've had a long standing collaboration with the team at Mass General. Uh, but as we've developed these donors, um, if you want to get into the world of xenotransplantation, there's only a couple sources of donors. Uh, and so um, as we've shown success, there's been a tremendous amount of inbound interest. And we're willing to work with folks you know, to enable this technology. I will have to admit we're reaching a point now where we're sort of maxing out on our ability to supply donors for um, multiple collaborators. And I think for us as a company, focusing on getting into the clinic uh, is incredibly important. So as much as we want to work with more collaborators, I think it's important for the field, we do reach kind of a practical limit of how many donors we can actually supply. So just to give you a little color on the next slide of how we think about editing. Um, again, we use CRISPR-Cas9. Uh, next slide, please. Um, on the far left, and the company was founded on this idea of using CRISPR-Cas9 to inactivate endogenous retroviruses. Every pig genome will contain anywhere from 50 to 70 copies of the, of the retrovirus. And until the discovery of CRISPR-Cas9, there was really no robust way that we could go and address. The, pro the challenge with the retroviruses is they're incorporated into the genome. Uh, so back in 2016, 2017, uh, George Church at Harvard showed that you could use CRISPR-Cas9 Cas9 to create a, a mutation in the retrovirus in the reverse transcriptase, which um, prevents the virus from replicating. So it adds an additional level of control and uh, redu reduction of risk of zoonotic transmission from porcine donors to humans. Um, next set of edits, we also use CRISPR-Cas9 uh, to inactivate the, the three glyco uh, glycosylation enzymes that Joe had mentioned. Um, to improve the carbohydrate compatibility between porcine donors and human recipients. And then the area where we spent really the most time is this incorporation of human transgenes into the porcine genome. Uh, I will say in our first versions of our donors, we had very poor expression, very poor control of, gene, uh, of where the genes went into the genome. Uh, as we've advanced now over the past five years, uh, we can add anywhere from seven to 12 genes uh, site specifically and now that we've had you know, over two years of post-transplant graft function, we can show that we have transgene expression, so expression of these human proteins um, two years uh, after transplant. I think the other question in the field is, you know, how many genes is enough genes? And I don't think anyone knows. 
Uh, and so the point we've made to the agency FDA and they've agreed is we need to start with a product with a reasonable rationale, right? And so this uh, product contains, uh, the clinical candidate contains seven regulatory transgenes, all with reasonable scientific rationale. Uh, and so far the agency has been um, supportive of us moving this donor uh, into the clinic. Just to give you a sense of how, and, and David showed some of this earlier on the next slide, of how we make our donors. Um, if we remember back to the mid 90s and the cloning of Dolly, which was the first ever mammalian clone, uh, we leveraged uh, a techn that technology that David described of what's called somatic cell nuclear transfer. Uh, I think we do this at a scale that's rare in the world. Again, four to 500 donors a year, um, not too many groups can do that. And then what we've also done recently um, and to our knowledge, we've now produced the first GMP grade clonal donor um, from OO sites um, that are not sourced from a slaughterhouse. Um, and those are the donors that we will have produced uh, in the third quarter. This is a production process that we reviewed with the FDA on three occasions now, and the FDA is comfortable with this approach, of course, as long as we produce uh, the, the requisite data. Uh, we, again, we have a portfolio of products on the next slide. Uh, our first product that will actually enter the clinic will be a, a product to support patients in liver failure. Uh, this is an extracorporeal perfusion product. Uh, we had a really positive meeting with the FDA in May. Um, and one advantage of this particular product over kidney transplant is we're measuring endpoints that are relatively short, right? So we, patients in acute liver failure have a very finite uh, um, projected mortality if they don't get a transplant. Right? And so the, one of the ideas simply is to bridge patients to transplant. The second is to bridge patients to recovery. Um, and so the clinical endpoints are short, making it amenable to relatively rapid clinical development. Of course, kidney transplant, we're looking for much longer endpoints, you know, years plus. And I think the heart program is somewhere in the middle. We're very similar to what they tried to do with Mr. David Bennett that David had talked about uh, is bridge patients from heart failure to transplant. So now I'll just take a few minutes to go a little bit deeper into our kidney program on the next slide. Um, this is uh, how we think about the kidney opportunity. Of course, we've talked a lot about patients on the wait list. And as David mentioned, patients 55 to 65 have very low likelihood of receiving a transplant. Um, and many of those patients will pass away or come off the transplant waiting list. Um, but of course, we have a growing number of patients that have had a previous human uh, kidney transplant. And at some point, many of those grafts will fail. They'll need a second graft um, or go back under dialysis. And of course, we have this very large population uh, and as David alluded to, that do relatively poorly over time, you know, 50% mortality in five years on dialysis uh, is not a great outcome. And so we view if we can solve this organ shortage, we can act, uh, address this whole population. So just to give you a sense of our data that we've seen in the non-human primate and why we're so excited about our program on the next slide. Um, so, and, and I think Joe alluded to this earlier, you know, in the, you know, the data on the left shows the outcomes in non-human primary porcine kidney transplants over the past 30 years. And really between 2010, 2020, you start to see several groups uh, able to achieve greater than one year post-transplant survival in the monkey. On the right summarizes our data. Our clinical donor is EGEN 2784. Um, the donor sitting next to that, EGEN 2734, has the same genetic edits, it just lacks the retroviral inactivation. Um, we make that donor first, and then we add the retroviral inactivation to make 2784. Uh, this is a total of 25 transplants. Uh, five of those recipients have now achieved over a year survival. Uh, two more are progressing to the to a one year. So if those two achieve the one year, we're looking at about a 30% success rate. And our discussions with the agency, they were comfortable with that because one of the challenges in this model is we, when we lose recipients, it's not just to rejection, right? So this slide represents all cause mortality. So if we lose the animal in the first week due to a surgical complication, that's reflected. If we lose the animal due to uh, opportunistic infection, that's reflected. If we lose the animal due to failure to thrive, one of the challenges is these animals don't eat very well immediately post-transplant, so there's significant body weight loss. All these things are not something you would typically see in a human transplant, but there's something that we have to struggle with in the primate. These are all things that we laid out to the agency and, and they get it. It's a very complicated model. You can't expect 100% success in the primate. It, it, it's almost unachievable, in our, at least in our experience. And so I think the agency is comfortable with the distribution of survival in the model, as long as we can explain it. So as we think ahead about where we're headed with this, uh, on the next slide, uh, um, we've had some inbound interest from collaborators around the world, um, not only in the US, uh, and we are starting two partnerships in Asia. Um, just to put in perspective, the unmet need in Asia Typical wait time in the U.S. for a decedent uh, kidney donation is five to seven years. Uh, in Japan, it's over 15. 
and this is partly driven by the fact that the Japanese culture doesn't recognize brain death. And so the availability of donors is much more limited. So there's a lot of excitement and interest in um, uh, xenotransplantation uh, from the Japanese government. Um, and I think there is an alternative clinical path in Japan, and we will be producing our donors in Japan. Uh, our target is before the end of this year. Uh, and then if you think about our programs overall, on the next slide, please. as I mentioned, our first program, to, so uh, about two years ago, we nominated our clinical development candidate. This candidate carries the triple knockout, uh, plus seven regulatory human transgenes, plus full retroviral inactivation. Uh, again, this will first see the clinic in our liver perfusion program. Uh, we expect to do a series of decedent studies, I think Joe alluded to this, where we're studying perfusion in patients that are in brain death, uh, very similar to what was done by Bob Montgomery at NYU and Jamie Locke at UAB, um, looking for the ability of the liver to detox and to maintain hemodynamic stability. Um, that will then lead into an IND submission early next year. Um, and then it does also, because this is such a high unmet need and patients are, are acutely uh, facing mortality, um, open the door for compassionate use. Um, we, ex we are planning to do a series of decedent studies um, in our kidney transplant program, is Joe's correct? Uh, so, you know, so, uh, sustaining a decedent for a year is not practical, but we do think sustaining a decedent longer than three days is possible. Um, and so this is something that we're exploring as we bring our donors into Japan um, and, and continue to build out our non-clinical program. Um, so with that, uh, thanks again for the opportunity. Um, and um, yeah, it's great to be part of this. And I think you know, in the next a uh, year, you're going to see um, the first, the start of the first clinical programs. And for, from a Genesis perspective, that will be for liver, but I think it's incredibly validating for the field of Xeno to move the first product into the clinic to help patients. Thank you, Dr. Curtis. We appreciate you joining us today. That was such a great session. Even watching it again, I still learned something new and am energized knowing that we, as a kidney community, are making great strides in increasing treatment options and improving care.